Hey everyone, uh, today we're going to take a look at a video that covers convergence of series. Um, and this is something that um, we have kind of been hinting at. We've been talking about like different things converging at different intervals, and we're like, oh, we're going to get some tests pretty soon that will tell us when a certain series converges. So, first, let's talk about what we know. So, for a geometric series, we know that if we have a first term a and a constant term r, so a plus a r plus a r squared, uh, that's going to end up equaling um, just a over 1 minus r. And this converges converges if absolute value of r is less than 1. So this is kind of what we're focusing on today, is when does a series converge? Geometric, we know if the ratio is less than 1, for sure we're going to converge. And then uh, when we started talking about Lagrange error, we talked about how we know that these three converge for all real numbers. And the unique thing about these guys is that we have a way to talk about their nth derivative because the Lagrange error remember is the n plus first derivative of some c value between the center and the x value you're approximating uh, times x minus a to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1 factorial and these guys are unique because e to the x the n plus first derivative of e to the x is always e to the x the n plus first derivative of sine and cosine is either sine plus or minus maybe or plus or minus cosine so e to the x is unique because we know that um, the derivative doesn't ever change, and the n plus 1 factorial will always end up canceling out e to any power. Um, and then the sine and cosine, the biggest this could be is 1, which is even better. So that means you're just left with the polynomial, and the n plus 1 factorial will for sure cancel it out. But the weird thing is there are a lot of functions that do not have this idea of a pattern to their derivatives. So um, like, for example, tan inverse tan inverse x we know is x uh, minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the fifth over 5. Remember, no, no factorials for that one. Um, and this came from an antiderivative of a uh, of 1 over 1 plus x squared, which is geometric. The second derivative of, um, so the first derivative of tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Second derivative would be negative 2x over 1 plus x squared squared. And... Um, these derivatives, the problem is they keep getting harder. So it's like the nth derivative. I have no idea what it is. There's no formula for it, right? Like with uh, e to the x, we know it's always e to the x. With sine and cosine, it's always some form of sine and cosine. So a function like this, the nth der derivative, I have no idea what it is. No, the n plus first. So the error has no pattern. And if the error has no pattern, then I'm not really sure what values this converges for. Um, this one's related to geometric, so it's going to be absolute x has to be less than 1, but that's unique also to geometric series. So it's like, well, what if we get something more generic? And what we're going to do is we're going to learn there are three possibilities to every power series. Remember, a power series is just sum from n equals 0 to infinity, c sub n, uh, x to the n. So that means that for every n we have an exponent on an x. Some of the cn's might be 0, but the first one's c0, and then c1x, c2x squared. And these c's can be anything, um, just as long as the x's are increasing in power. Um, and so the every power series will converge at its center. So if we think about this, instead of being centered at 0, was x minus a to the n. When you plug in a, you're always going to get just c0, because you have c1x minus a c2, x minus a squared. If you plug in a, everything goes away except for the first term. So we know for sure it converges at the center. Beyond that, one of three things can happen. One is um, that you converge around a certain radius. So uh, first option is there is a positive number. capital R, such that the series converges uh, for absolute x minus R, uh, x minus, uh, let me think about this, absolute x minus A, less than R, sorry. So what that means is, I think about it on a number line. So here's your center, converges there for sure. And then this would be a plus r, and this would be a minus r. So what that says is that um, if you're within that those bounds, for sure, you're going to converge. So an example of that is geometric, right? Uh, for geometric, if you're less than 1, you're for sure going to converge. Um, and then 
diverges for absolute x minus a greater than r. Okay, so there are a lot of series like this that converge around a certain radius, but then outside of it. So if you're anywhere outside, if you use an x value anywhere else, that's where it's going to diverge. Um, and then the tricky thing with this is that the endpoints, the endpoints, and that would be where you're at uh, a plus r and a minus r. So a plus r and a minus r depend on the series. And we're going to learn a lot more about that. There are some where uh, the endpoints both converge. There are some points where the endpoints don't converge at all. There are some where one endpoint converges and the other one doesn't. And we'll get to see all kinds of those. The second option is that uh, it converges for all real numbers. Okay, that would be like e to the x, sine x, cosine x. Okay, those converge for any real number that you plug in. The third option is it only converges at the center. At this center. Okay, so an example of that would be the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, n factorial x to the n. Okay, definitely a power series because those n's are going to get bigger. But the problem is that n factorial keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not converging to anything. It's just going to keep getting bigger. And so it's going to diverge away, way, and away. So one of these things happens. One of these three things happens. Number one is definitely the most interesting one where you have some radius around a value where it works. Um, it's nice when you have something converge for all real numbers, but it doesn't always happen. Yeah. So now, how do we figure out which possibility we're in? is we need some uh, some more tools. So, first tool that we have is geometric. Remember, if you have a over 1 minus r, that only works if absolute r is less than 1. Don't forget that. So if you see something in that form of that fraction, um, always think of that in terms of geometric series. Um, the second thing that could happen is you could fail the nth term test. So we talked about the nth term test a while back. That was where if you have sum um, from n equals 0 to infinity, a sub n, and the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is not 0, then it diverges. And what we're talking about there is basically if you end up adding terms at the end that are not close to zero, you're going to keep adding a number over and over again, so it's going to end up diverging. These two we've talked about already. So our first new tool here uh, is called the comparison test. This one makes sense to me. I think it makes some logical sense. Oop, that's supposed to be an underline, not a strike through. So the comparison says, test says that um, you need... So sum from n equals 0 to infinity, a sub n. So if the sum from n equals 0 to infinity, a sub n, is a series with only positive terms. I'm talking about that since important in a second. Only positive terms. Then a, a n converges. Uh, if there's some CN that converges and AN is less than CN uh, for all large N. So in other words, when little N is greater than some big N. Uh, so what this means is if you have some CN that's converging, let's say it looks like this, and then, whoops, gotta go back. Skip the way too many. Okay. So if this is our CN, and then we say, well, I know AN is always less than CN. 
So an's our bottom one. Well, if cn is converging to something and an is always less, then it's also going to converge, right? So let's read this through again. So an converges if cn converges and an is less than cn for all large n. So what that means is I don't care what goes on at the beginning, but eventually it has to settle down to be less than cn for the rest of, um, well, forever, for an, uh, off to infinity because we have to be sandwiched in there. So it's kind of like sandwich theorem because we're squeezing down. So now the reason it has to have positive terms. Well, if I have negative terms, it's possible to diverge, but they're still all less than cn. So this only may really make sense if you have positive terms. The other thing, this works the other way too. So an diverges. Oh, keep going ahead slides. I don't like that. <laughs> so an is going to diverge if sum of dn diverges and an is greater than dn for large n. So what that means is if you have something that's diverging dn and then an is always bigger well then it for sure diverges. I don't know why I keep skipping ahead there. Goodness. Okay. All right, so let's use that. Let's do an example. So I want to show that this guy converges for all values of x. So we have to think about what we can compare this to. I'm going to write this a little bit differently. So I'm going to write this as the sum n equals 0 to infinity x squared to the nth power divided by n factorial squared. Now what we want to do is compare this to something that we know converges for all x values. Um, well, we know that x to the t x squared to the n over n factorial squared is for sure less than or equal to that squared, not factorial again. There we go. So we know this is less than or equal to uh, x squared to the n divided by n factorial, because if we're squaring the bottom, that's just making it smaller. And this guy right here, you might recognize, um, that would be 1 plus x squared plus x squared squared over 2 factorial plus x squared uh, cubed over 3 factorial. And this is just e to the x squared. which we know converges for all x, and it's all positive. So since this converges, and this guy always has terms that are less, that guarantees this converges for all x. Now, what does it converge to? We don't know that, and honestly, we really don't care. All we want to show right now is that this converges for either some x for like around a certain radius, or just at x equals a, or in this case, it converges for every real number x. All right, let's check out something else. So what if we have negative terms? Because we said with the comparison test, even if you have something that converges, uh, if you had something with negative terms, obviously they're always going to be less than the positive ones. But um, we need something that will show that something that converges, even if it's alternating, uh, if it's converging to something, then we should still have a test for it. So start with the definition. If the sum of absolute values converges, then the sum of the series converges absolutely. So absolutely means um, that it converges in absolute value. So for example, uh, if we had a series that looked like this, so these are like partial sums maybe, if we just take the absolute value of all of them, then it would end up looking like this. So this is just a definition, is that if the absolute values converge, then we say that the series converges absolutely. Now, how is that helpful? Well, let me turn my page here. Um, okay, so this is a definition of absolute convergence, and this doesn't really maybe seem like a test, but this is test number four. Uh, it's called the absolute convergence test, and it's just if... Uh, the sum of absolute a n converges. So if it converges absolutely, then the sum of a sub n converges.
So in other words, absolute convergence implies uh, convergence. So if you have something that's alternating, if you just say, well, I can show that the absolute value converges, then that guarantees that the alternating series also converges. That's mainly when this is useful. So let's take an example. So show that the sum from n equals 0 to infinity sine x to the n over n factorial converges for all x. So the first thing is, why can't we use comparison? Well, the answer is because sine x sometimes is negative. Sine x is between negative 1 and 1. So if I take sine x to the n for uh, different values of x, um, if I choose some x's that give me a negative number there, then I'm going to have it alternating. But what we're going to show is it converges absolutely, so try to show absolute convergence. And that'll promise that the series itself converges as well. So to show absolute convergence, I'm going to do sum from n equals 0 to infinity, absolute value sine x to the n. Divided by n factorial. Well, absolute sine x to the n over n uh, factorial. The n factorial is always positive. So this guy is just absolute sine x to the nth power divided by n factorial. And I know that that is always less than or equal to 1 to the n over n factorial. Which is just 1 over n factorial. And let's think what that would be. Um, if I wrote this out. That would be 1 plus uh, 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 3 factorial. And some of you might see that this is e to the 1, which is e. So that means that um, since e for sure it converges to itself, I know that this is going to converge to something that's less than e. So that means that this is absolutely convergent. Absolute convergence. And based on our fourth tool there, that means that um, the whole thing from n equals 0 to infinity sine x to the n over n factorial converges. Now again, I have no idea converges. I think that sort of sets converges. I have no idea what it converges to, but it doesn't matter. All that I've shown is that it converges for every value of x, and that was my goal. Cool. All right, so now the biggest convergence test that we have is called the ratio test. I call it the Taj Mahal of convergence tests because it is the one that you use all the time. AP always asks a question about the ratio test on the free response portion. So here's what the ratio test says. Um, so if you have a series, so sum a sub n is a series with positive terms. So it's important that they're positive. And what do you think we do if they're not positive? Well, what we just did with the sign, right? You take the absolute, show that it's absolutely convergent, and then that guarantees that the original is convergent as well. Okay, so if we have the sum of uh, a whole bunch of terms to make a series with positive terms only, and what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as n approaches infinity, of the n plus first term divided by a sub n. And we're going to get that limit, and let's say that limit is L. So three things happen. First of all, if that ratio gives us a limit that is less than 1, so it converges if L is less than 1, it diverges if L is uh, greater than 1, and it's inconclusive if L equals 1. So now, if a n just is a function or a uh, series based on n, this is the end of the line. Is it converges if it's less than 1, diverges if it's greater than 1, and if it's equal to 1, then you have to do more work. I'll write that next to this more work. And we're going to learn about that uh, in 9.5. But if there is an x in a n, okay, so if there's some kind of an x in here, then the L will depend on x. So if the series has an x, 
then what that means is that for some values of x, it'll converge because it'll make that limit less than 1. For some values of x, it'll make it diverge. And for some values of x, we have to do more work. And that's kind of the whole point of the ratio test. This is a very simple test. You just divide the n plus first term, divided by the nth term, get that limit. And then you say, well, if it's less than 1, it converges. Greater than 1, it diverges. And if it's equal to 1, we've got to do more work. Very, very powerful. And to me, I think that like this is kind of intuitive. Because basically what you're doing is you're saying, well, if the division of terms is a number less than one, so if we're, our, our ratio of terms is getting smaller, then that would mean that it converges. And if it's getting bigger, then that would mean that you're going to end up diverging. Kind of cool. Let's try it. So find the radius of convergence for this guy. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do limit as n approaches infinity of the n plus first term divided by the nth term. Now this for x values that are less than zero, we could have negative terms. So we're going to have to do this absolute value. Okay. So we have to do it because it has to be positive terms. So we have a limit as n approaches infinity, absolute value n x to the n divided by, sorry, I got to do my n plus one here. That's that. So uh, we're going to have the n plus first term, so be n plus 1, x to the n plus 1, uh, divided by 10 to the n plus 1, all divided by n x to the n, divided by 10 to the n, all in absolute value. Now, all the n's will be positive. The only thing that needs the absolute is the x's. So I'm going to write it that way. So we have limit as n approaches infinity. Uh, n plus 1. Absolute value of x to the n plus 1. Divided by 10 to the n plus 1. And I'm going to multiply by the uh, reciprocal of the bottom. So we'll have 10 to the n. Uh, divided by n absolute x to the n. Okay, so 10 to the n over 10 to the n plus 1 leaves us with 1, 10 on the bottom. x to the n plus 1 over x to the n leaves us just with 1x on the top. And then n plus 1 over n. So as n goes to infinity, not 0, uh, n plus 1 over n is going to turn into 1. So this is absolute x over 10. Now that's what we talked about before. This is my L. Okay, So I'm going to go back to ratio test here. So I need that L to be less than 1, then it will converge. So if L is less than 1, in other words, absolute x over 10 is less than 1, we converge. Well, I'll just multiply by 10. Absolute x needs to be less than 10. So the radius is 10. Now, I don't know what happens when x equals 10 because that's going to be when L is equal to 1. Uh, but if absolute value of X is less than 10, that gives me my radius of convergence. So negative 10 less than X less than 10 would be my interval. So if X is between negative 10 and 10, if I'm somewhere in between there, I know it's for sure going to converge. Again, don't know what it converges to. Don't care. But this is super, super useful. All right, let's do some more. Now, these guys don't have an x, which is fine. If the limit is less than 1, it'll always converge. If it's greater than 1, it'll always diverge. So the question is, does this guy converge? Well, it's the ratio test. So we need the limit as n approaches infinity, a n plus 1 divided by a n. This is always going to be positive, so we don't have to worry about the absolute values. So the limit as n approaches infinity, a n plus 1 will be 3 to the n plus 1 divided by 5 to the n plus 1 plus 1 divided by 3 to the n over 5 to the n plus 1. Multiply by the reciprocal. So we have 3 to the n plus 1 over 5 to the n plus 1 plus 1. Multiply by 5 to the n plus 1 divided by 3 to the n. So 3 to the n plus 1 divided by 3 to the n, that's a 3 on the top. And then we have uh, times, let me just write this as 5 to the n plus 1, 
divided by 5 to the n plus 1 plus 1. Now as n goes to infinity, these 1s will not matter at all. So now we just have 3 fifths. Okay, and that's 3 fifths. And the question is, is that less than 1? Yes. So our L value is less than 1, so this guy converges for sure. Okay, it's a really useful tool that kind of eliminates some of the guesswork here. So now this guy, n factorial we know is big, so this does not look like it's going to converge at all. Uh, but let's try it. So if we do a ratio test, limit as n approaches infinity, n plus 1 factorial, x to the n plus 1, divided by n factorial x to the n. You need absolutes here, because if x is negative, we can have negative numbers. So that is uh, n plus 1 over n, that is just going to be x. And n plus 1 factorial, remember that's n plus 1, n, n minus 1, n minus 2. And this whole piece is n factorial. So that'll all cancel. I'll just be left with n plus 1. Limit as n approaches infinity. So I have n plus 1 times x, and then n plus 1 over n is just x. So as n goes to infinity, no matter what your x value is, this guy goes to infinity. So this guy is going to diverge, because that is for sure bigger than 1. Nifty. All right, endpoints will be coming soon. So um, some good examples of that. If you have some n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n, or some n equals 0 to infinity, 1 over n squared. So remember, back when we did this with integration, 1 over x, remember when we stopped, went out to infinity, that was the one that did not converge. And then 1 over n squared did. And let's see what ratio test tells us. So do 1 over n plus 1 divided by 1 over n. That is n over n plus 1 which goes to 1 as n goes to infinity, which is inconclusive, not useful. This guy, I think the same thing happens, 1 over n plus 1 squared, divided by 1 over n squared. That is n squared over n squared plus 2n plus 1. Again, this guy goes to 1, so it's inconclusive. So we'll talk about how to deal with those endpoints where we get those inconclusive uh, uh, cases soon. And uh, just check out your homework on the board and on your calendar. And I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Love you guys. That's why I'm here. Have a great day.